Thank you, Chi, and thank you, Jim and Noreen, for the invitation. Um, so, although I'm in Madison and this is my beautiful uh, lake in Madison on the screen, I want to just take a minute because I have a little bit longer history with OPR than uh, many might know, which is that um, 15 years ago or so, um, I was a graduate student in Wisconsin and applied to be part of a research group or research um, team and, and data analysis team for the Texas Higher Education Opportunity Project that Martha Tienda uh, ran. And, and I'm just, I was reflecting back on that in the last few weeks before this talk. And, and just um, when I first uh, met Marta, I was a, really a, just a graduate student, fourth year graduate student, and she really um, was so welcoming that uh, I still kind of recall how, um, um, how productive the workshop was, how everything just seemed um, so, so nice and, and be really involved in a, a very interesting uh, team. <laughs> and and I, I just want to take this time to, yeah, Mark, Mar I, I want to take the time just to say I look back and I'm really thankful for her willingness to spend time with a junior scholar like me 15 years ago. We wrote several papers together and um, she, I know that she may, as a former OPR director, I thought it'd be a nice uh, remembrance that, that she made a big difference in a lot of people's lives, but um, I think great mentors like her should be celebrated, especially those that are generous who, you know, go outside their institution and work with graduate students who they don't know. And um, so I really appreciate that. So thank you, Marta. Um, so for today, switching gears, I'm going to be talking about the production of with, within family inequality. Um, so it's, it's new work. I really am looking forward to your questions. I've only presented it one time and um, it, it integrates in, a, I think, it, I hopefully integrates in an interesting way, uh, genetic data with some very straightforward demographic questions about the family. I'll acknowledge uh, I have a working with a great team here. We're also interdisciplinary. Uh, Chiang Shi Lu is an assistant professor in the Department of Biostats here, um, who's just been wonderful to work with. And he, he's assembled a huge team and this is just a few members of them on this paper. So this is a complicated, well, it's straightforward, but also complicated this paper, I think. Um, so for, in it, in it, and it's a little bit, maybe even has a, little bit of a split personality, which is to say that um, for social science, it's the, the main point is to try to bring in genetic um, measurements. And I'm going to say predispositions and quotes for a while because I want to tell you what, how they're measured in a few slides. So just think very uh, generically about genetic predispositions for a few slides. But the idea here is to measure, to enhance measurement of a set of predispositions for a range of traits and outcomes, which could allow different and potentially much more interesting and expansive, and expansive measurements very early in life, essentially at conception. So that might allow us to examine in doubt, uh, the effects of early childhood in a, in a new way. So that's the social science part, or the, very briefly. And, and you might think of this as a, if you start with how we do this type of analysis now, it would, the typical case would be we examine birth weight variation as an early life indicator across individuals and ask how that affects longer term health or SES, both within families and between families. So it's in this sense that I'll describe uh, the potential for a very large expansion in measurement this early in life. So shifting gears on for genetics, um, I think the paper continues to build on what is it we're measuring? So what do current measurements of these quote unquote predispositions represent? And I think genetics will be, um, we'll see as valuable some social science ideas about what they could be measuring and strategies to uh, reveal what they're measuring. So those are the two um, kind of split personality aspects of a single paper. I'm gonna give you the some of the headlines to begin with the, to give you a sense of where I'm going, which is one, it probably won't be familiar to a lot of participants on the call, but th there's a data set of 500,000 UK individuals. And among those 500,000 participants, there's 
many, many, many siblings. I'm going to be using 33,000 siblings. It's just a huge data set of siblings in its own. I think that this will allow a lot of interesting sibling type analysis to be done. I'm going to be examining educational attainment, I'll often abbreviate it as EA. These genetic predispositions, I'm going to further detail in the, the next few slides, are going to are called polygenic scores, often abbreviated in the slides as PGS. So there's quite a few abbreviations that I'll come back to. But the, the core of the paper is to ask whether when you have sets of two siblings and you compare them on their polygenic scores for education, so EAPGS would be educational attainment polygenic scores, or again in quotes, pre genetic predispositions for educational attainment. When you compare these scores that are measured at conception and among the two siblings, the question is whether the sibling with the higher score um, has differential relationships between their genetics and their outcomes. So that's the test. And what we find is in fact th that they do, that the, the higher ranked sibling has lower, um, has, smaller, has a smaller relationship between their polygenic scores and their eventual educational attainment than their lower ranked sibling. So that's, uh, so this is where we're gonna des describe this as an indirect test of how families are reacting to early endowments with this new measurement. And I'm gonna also describe a set of additional findings that hopefully rule out many of the alternative hypotheses that you all are probably having in your minds right now. So that's what, so I'll get there shortly. So I've re restated the main finding and then how, where it has implications for these two different disciplines or sets of disciplines is that for genetics, I think it reveals the importance of collaborations with social science and demography, which is to say that we need to interpret these genetic effects and we need models and we need um, methods from outside of genetics to think about these interpretations. So within family processes, would be this would be obvious to probably everyone here, but it won't be obvious to many geneticists that these within family processes actually shape the relationship between genetics and outcomes. And we put a finer point on with the paper that it's not all outcomes. We find clear evidence for educational attainment and we find no evidence for height, for example. Back to social science, I think it's consistent with what we might know from the literature or what we've um, seen over and over again in the literature, where in high SES contexts, there's, I think, a a, a typical finding that parents re reallocate resources towards children with lower endowment. And I think our evidence are consistent with that so-called compensation. And our evidence, um, our analysis has this extra um, interpretation that is both relevant for genetics and social science, which is that using sibling differences isn't a panacea. And it, I think it will remain to not be a panacea in, in, in a lot of ways in the same ways that demographers would already acknowledge. So these, gene these genetic predispositions in quotes, what are they? So what is a polygenic score? First, and as an example, what is a polygenic score for something in particular like educational attainment? And it's two steps that I'll describe in just a little bit more detail here. First is that you have a big study that does um, statistical linkage with um, across across each part of the genome, asking whether a particular variant is related to education. What about this variant? What about this variant? What about this variant? And does that many, many times, as I'll describe in the next slide. And, the, and step two is to take all those effects from the big study and create these polygenic scores in some other data set where you essentially fuse together the effect sizes that you've discovered from the GWAS with the DNA from the smaller study. So it's essentially taking the GWAS effect sizes and taking my DNA and building a building a polygenic score for me based on my DNA combined with these effect sizes. So I'll restate that in the next couple slides also. So genome, genome-wide association study is that is an association study across the whole genome. We've got on the upper right, just our chromosomes, just to say that there are locations in the genome where individuals differ. And this analysis just uh, runs through all these locations and, and, and often has many, many thousands of statist statistical tests 
um, and then visualizes those tests in the figure that I have on the bottom, which is called a Manhattan plot, which is to say, location by location, where are the peaks in the genome that are related to educational attainment in this case? And so where you see big towers here, those are, that's evidence for specific locations in the genome that are associated with education or individual differences in education in the population. Part two is you take that Manhattan plot and then you bring it over in the way I described to another data set, which is to say you take all those findings and you, for the purposes of prediction outside the sample, um, create polygenic scores. So again, in words, a polygenic score is you add together location by location, effect size by effect size across the whole genome. Again, and you add all those effect sizes together in an individual's DNA who is outside the original study or outside the GWAS. So it turns out that it, it turns out that almost all these individual effect sizes are tiny, vanishingly small. And, but, so partly to combat that, uh, what is done is, is you add them all up. So you're adding up hundreds of thousands of effect sizes to create these polygenic scores. I can pause for a minute if there's a clarification there, because this is, this is all for the purposes of, of describing what the actual measurement of genetics or genetic predispositions of the study is. So that's where we are. If there's a clarifying question now, I could take it. So once you have this measure, like a test score or a credit score, what does it mean? And, and that's what, where it gets quite complicated, which is to say that it's all based on an analysis of association. And like any analysis of association, it's unclear what the mechanisms are here. But briefly, it's going to be some set of actual causal genetic effects, potentially, meaning that if an individual has one genetic variant versus another, they might have a small effect on their educational attainment or their height or their whatever the outcome is. But more and more, it's understood that the, the mix is not just causal genetic effects, but it's other stuff other stuff that's that's not causal genetic effects. And one of it is just the, maybe the most obvious part from a social science point of view, which is that, that biological children are related to their, are genetically related to their biological parents. And it's a very strong correlation between child's genes and parents' genes. So when you examine the effect of a child's genes on their educational outcome, it's, it's quite difficult to separate his or her own genetic effects from the parents who raised that, that child. And then, so those are, that's maybe the most obvious, so maybe the less obvious from a social science point of view is that there's other stuff in the genome that is tagging essentially where your family's genealogy came from. You know, were you in Portugal in a certain period of time or Spain at a certain period of time and so on. And those little bits of other stuff of, 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 of ancestry could, um, serve as a confounding effect on these outcomes downstream that aren't strictly genetic. So that's a lot of stuff. And there's been some excitement in the literature in the last few years that maybe comparing siblings could solve most of these problems. Because if you look at my list, if you compare siblings, you could potentially get rid of the family background effect for full, for full biological siblings. They share the same parents and they have a, some shared family background that you can take out if you use sibling difference models and other stuff, they also share this genealogy uh, apart from just their parent, biological parents. So there's some promise of using siblings could really solve some of these problems. And that's what we'll provide some evidence against, I think, in, in shortly. So that's all the genetics side. I'm, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a cartoon of the demography here, which is to say, you know, we have this data set of siblings, what kind of models should be thinking about when, when you look at what we're actually going to do. And again, the cartoon is that children's outcomes are determined by some set of parental investments, child uh, endowments and luck and the interactions of all these things, of all these uh, factors. And noting that parental investments could likely respond to the endowments um, for a specific child where the parent might invest more or less depending on these endowments. And then for our paper, it's important to point out 
the parents of multiple children may also have goals over the distribution of their children's outcomes. So those are typically labeled as they could be reinforcing. Um, parents could have uh, preferences for essentially having um, highest level of attainment for one of their children versus they might have preferences for similarity in the outcomes of their children. And those would have um, implications for the, the parents' decisions on how they treat their children. So that's, again, I'll, I'll continue with the cartoon here. But the main, main point is that when you actually try to test this with data, you realize that it's often true that you have quite crude measurements of most of these processes especially when you're talking about allocating resources within families to siblings or to multiple children. And so I, th I would say it's typically the case that researchers can't measure so well, you know, the, the basket of endowments that you'd like to know, parental goals, parental investments, or the mapping between all these endowments and investments and the final outcome. So it's all difficult to measure, and I think the polygen score has a possibility of helping with one narrow aspect here, which is that there's a possibility that endowments could be measured differently and potentially broader with the use of polygenic scores. And then we make the claim in the paper that measurement of polygenic scores and outcomes for sets of siblings allow some indirect inference on parental goals in the way I described earlier. And then from, again, from a social science or demography hat, you think that these processes, these family processes could shed light on whether it's appropriate to interpret the links between polygenic scores and outcomes as quote unquote genetic or, or not, or, or a mix of family and genetics. For those not so familiar with the literature, I'll provide another you know, cartoon of what a typical paper in the literature would do. <clears throat> a typical paper, I think the, mo the modal paper would have measurements of endowments of uh, reflecting birth weights that's, that's, off, that's in many data sets. So you have birth weights of siblings and then might have some sort of measurements of parental investments. These are quite constrained in many data sets because you're essentially looking for measurements where um, siblings would, could differ. Um, sometimes breastfeeding is used for medical care like immunization, sometimes going to private school versus public school. But you, you'll recognize, I think, that it's that parents in some ways overwhelmingly treat their children the same, but so it's hard to actually measure all the ways they treat them differently or some of the ways they treat them differently. So that's a difficulty. And then they and then the, this typical car cartoon paper that I'm describing would link birth weights with parental investments to examine um, longer term outcomes of the children. So do, pa do parents seem to react to the high birth weight sibling in breastfeeding them more? And does that seem to then be linked to higher market labor market earnings, for example? So, so restating the little literature struggles with the set of domains of endowments is pretty constrained. I'd say birth weight's the modal one. Sometimes, people, sometimes researchers will use early life test scores, which have their own complications. Um, measuring in debt investments that differ between siblings is quite difficult and then directly assessing these parental preferences is hard. So we're not, so the polygenic scores really is only targeted to this one measuring of endowments aspect. It doesn't get us around these other measurement issues. And that's why we think of these as indirect tests that we're gonna be examining. So our indirect test is to use these polygenic scores or these quote unquote genetic um, predispositions as indicators of endowments and ask whether the, the child, the sibling that has a higher polygenic score within the sibling pair has a bigger effect of their polygenic score on their outcome or a smaller effect based on these sibling rankings. Before we examine this, so we, we chose our outcomes, one to be educational attainment as we think of it as, as, as something that might be um, likely to have parental investments and these parental preferences attached to it. Whereas, and we also found, we also attempted to find one, uh, an outcome that was a little bit more of a negative test. And we thought of height as a reasonable first case where um, parents probably have less uh, ability to affect the late adult height of their kid, even if they wanted to. And, and also probably have weaker preferences over the heights of the, the relative heights of their children. We anticipate because we're using the UK 
that um, we're going to find lower genetic penetrance. That is, the polygenic scores are going to be uh, have lower effect sizes in the higher rank sibling, and that would that again indirectly to us suggest compensation in uh, from the parents. I'll restate the biobank. So it's approximately 500,000 respondents. I think it's relatively uh, not very well known in the social sciences. So I'll spend a, a minute on it because it has these very interesting uh, elements in it. So the ages are there, uh, you know, mid to older age adults. Uh, but because there's so many people and because they have their genetics assessed, uh, the biobank can also provide uh, genetic based linkages between people who are biological siblings or cousins or parents and children and so on in the data. So it's not a family-based survey, but because of the genetics, you can piece together who are biological family members in a, in a sample size of 500,000. We're going to have a measurement that's used in the literature. It's, it's a polygenic score from a, from a particular paper. We're going to use educational attainment self-reported in the data. The key variable is this indicator for which of the two siblings in the pair has a higher polygenic score. It will include these family level fixed effects or indicator variables for the 16,000 plus pairs. And the core uh, coefficient is this beta four at the bottom, which is to say whether if the individual is the has the larger polygenic score of the two, whether the quote unquote or the whether their association between their polygenic score for education and their actual education is larger or smaller. So it's beta four is the main item of interest. So before we get into the interactions, just to give you a sense of effect sizes and so on, um, we're going to have four hundred thousand people in the data. In the first column, you see the associations between the polygenic score, which is standardized. So it's a one standard deviation change in the polygenic score is associated with a nearly one year difference in schooling in the population. You can you can benchmark that with the male female difference in education. Uh, underneath this, there's a complete set of age fixed effects and um, other, I'll just call them genetic controls for now, but I can provide additional clarification later if, you, if anyone would like. Moving to column two, all, all that's happening is that instead of looking at the full data set, we're looking at the sibling data set, but not yet with sibling fixed effects, just to say how different are the siblings. Um, so the siblings have, I, I would say, quite similar relationships as the main sample, which is to say it's a one standard deviation change in the polygenic score is about a year difference in schooling. And then the final column in this table include sibling fixed effects. And this is common in the literature where the quote unquote genetic effects are, are shaved off, are cut in half essentially. So that's evidence consistent with the literature that part of these you know, quote unquote genetic predispositions are indeed, um, it should be better interpreted as family background effects, some other uh, effects that are not causal genetic effects. So about half the size is, is cut from the association. I'll next move to the, to the main results, which is column one. I've added the main effects and interactions that I showed previously, which is to say that I have an indicator for of the pair who's the older. There's still age fixed effects throughout. I have an indicator for which sibling, are you the sibling with the higher polygenic score than your co-sibling? And then the interaction. So the what you can see is you can if you compare the polygenic score association with the interaction is that if you're a large if you're the sibling with the larger polygenic score of the two, then the relationship between your genetics and your outcome is cut by about 25% if you are that higher ranked sibling. So that's where we interpret as evidence, indirect evidence for parental compensation, where parent where parents actually shift resources towards the child with the lower polygenic score. We subset the data here. So going from column one to columns two and three, we split the data into uh, people who were born in places that are high SES versus low SES, still within U the UK. So it's every, everyone's in the UK. We, we have a geographic coordinates of where everyone was born. And we place, we split the sample into those born with higher, those born in places that have higher um, attainments and those that have lower attainments. And what we see 
is that for higher for the high SES places, we have this almost almost half, but I'll, I'll call it forty percent reduction in the genetic penetrance and the relationship between your genes and your outcomes. Almost forty percent is cut if you're both the higher ranked uh, sibling and you're in a relatively high SES place. So again, still consistent with the broader literature on compensation being higher in the most advantaged places. And for the half the sample that are in the low SES places, that we don't see a, a relationship. We don't see uh, evidence of either compensation or reinforcement. That's our main finding. Uh, I'll show you the figures around those findings. On the left-hand side, it's the low SES places. The right-hand side is the high SES places. So we're mapping genetics into attainments here as we move across the genetic distribution. Left-hand side is the low polygenic scores right-hand side of the, of the horizontal axis, in each case is a high. And you just see a flattening slope for those siblings who are the higher rank siblings. So it's just a visual representation of that last table. If you, if you end up being the, the sibling that has a higher polygenic score for education than your, than your co-sibling, then those, th those genetic effects are smaller in our, in our data. And they're smaller if, you're, if you live in a high SES place. The paper goes into more detail, but we failed to find some effects that I think are worthy of, 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 of what the scope of these findings are, which is to say we found nothing for height. So being the high, the high polygenic score height sibling had no interactive effect with your actual height. We found no effects, no interaction effects with sex, again, of the pairs, and no interactive effects of being the older versus the younger of the sibling pair. They all kind of look like what I have here is that genetics um, or in this case uh, sex female versus male sex matters for attainments but they don't matter differentially by genotype. Finally we run an analysis again to broadly try to constrain the interpretations to siblings in families versus other things that I'm sure other people are going to bring up. So this is this is going to be my response to some of your questions, which is to say, because there's 500,000 people in the UK biobank, there are many other genetic relationships among those people that are not siblings. So we've essentially taking, taken the genetic relationships of, uh, you should think of these as cousins, but they could include second cousins and other uh, genetic relations among the 500,000 people. And we essentially replicated this analysis. We took pairs of people who have a cousin in the data, and we can assign which of those two people have a higher polygenic score than their cousin. And we run the analysis the same with these cousin fixed effects or you know the, the family fixed effects. And we don't see anything with rank. We don't see this interaction effect for these cousins and so on. So again, I think this limits um, what processes we're talking about in the paper, or what processes we might be revealing to being those within nuclear families, within sibling pairs and how their parents treat them, maybe how their teachers treat them. We can't rule that out. But we're, this table is meant to constrain these analysis to be about siblings and they're not about cousins or other related processes. I have some backup tables anticipating some questions, but I'll um, move into my conclusions, which are to go back to the, the setup, which is that the, we're attempting to speak some to the demography audience and some to the genetics audience, which is that we're combining genetic measurement and some practices from social science to examine sibling differences in endowments. So we pre present new evidence that families reduce this quote-unquote genetic inequality between siblings. We leverage polygenic scores as endowments, as a novel way of thinking about endowments, and, and we also need a large sample of siblings. And I, I described how the UK Biobank has over 30,000 individuals who are members of sibling pairs, which is a very large effect. So parenthetically, we wouldn't have the power in other maybe well-known samples like the Ad Health or the other Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, I think, to do this analysis because of only having 500 or 1,000 siblings or, or however many. Our interpretation of these polygenic score effects, again, we're shutting down family-level factors that are shared, 
is complicated. So we say, so we believe that sibling fixed effects alone are not enough to uh, then interpret these quote unquote genetic effects as causal genetic effects. We're silent on, on well, we, we can't bring evidence of why the higher rank sibling seems to have lower genetic penetrance in our analysis. That, that is a limitation of the data. It's not built, it's not a household sample. It's not built to answer these questions about how, print, how parents invested in their children and so on. So that, so this is a, a, an analysis that's um, indirectly inferring what's, ha what's happened in the past for these individuals. And the, the other thing to point out, this is more for the genetics audience, is that these polygenic scores, part of their um, advantage is that you can port them into any data set. If you had a small data set of 100 people in New Jersey that had genotypes, you could bring over polygenic scores from the UK and examine relationships between quote unquote genetics and um, outcomes. And we're showing that it's, it's, um, it's more subtle than that, that, that um, families have important components of what these quote unquote genetic effects are in mapping genetics to outcomes that families are really seem to be important there. So those are, the, those are some uh, cautions. But if we move back to the optimistic part of the story, is that to the extent we can figure some of this out um, in terms of how to interpret any given polygenic score, there is a lot of, uh, you should be very optimistic in how we could potentially expand polygenic scores. Because once we get it right once, uh, which is to say, once we had the correct modeling for polygenic scores linking to outcomes, the, the process of polygenic scores themselves um, allow us to link this to thousands of traits. You, you, really, you could think of, of essentially any trait that's measured in a large sample, we could create a polygenic score for it and then ask whether genetics related to that trait at conception seems to have these sim similar kind of processes as this paper describes. So in this paper, it's only, we only examine educational attainment and height, but we could do any trait that um, has those features. So I think, so you could think of anything between schizophrenia, um, the genetics of schizophrenia and how that, if that, how early in life that might um, be observable and so on. So th there's a lot of, uh, I think, upside of using polygenic scores to examine endowments uh, quite early in life. And let me uh, finish by advertising Dalton's book and, uh, and thanking and uh, thanking you all for your attention and I'm interested in hearing your questions.